Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to thank MSD Ireland for sponsoring the Oncology Spotlight podcast. A sincere thanks to all of the MSD Ireland team for their continued support. Hello and welcome to Oncology Spotlight. Today, we have Dr. Mihil Strebos, who is a medical oncologist and healthcare tech enthusiast. Dr. Strebos focuses on the research and treatment of GU malignancies. He is currently active in several task forces and committees with regards to GU malignancies and is a principal investigator in several clinical trials. In addition to his impressive academic credentials, he was the chair of the ESMO Practicing Oncologist Working Group and serves as a member of the Publishing Group and Educational Committee. We're excited to have Dr. Strabus here to share his insights and perspectives with us today. Without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. Okay, to kick off, um, can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and your background? My name is Michiel Spabos. Uh, I'm 46 years old. I was born in the Netherlands, but spent most of my life uh, studying and working as a medical oncologist in Belgium. I currently work in Antwerp in the largest oncology practice in Belgium, where I focus mainly on genital urinary cancers with a specific focus on prostate cancer. Great. What inspired you to pursue a career in uh, medical oncology? I actually didn't want to become a medical oncologist. I've always been very interested in medicine in general, but my initial thoughts were to become a cardiologist. So I spent all my training learning about EKGs, um, cardiac diseases. And when I started my internship in cardiology, I was super excited that after one day of consultations and prescribing aspirin, beta blockers, and statins, I knew this wasn't for me. And then I switched to my oncology rotation, and it was actually my supervisor there, Stefan Sleifer, who is, is now the dean of the, the Rotterdam and Hasmus University, who told me about how oncology was transforming from a, a almost fatal specialty in, in which we'd be, be telling patients horrible news 95% of the times to a discipline in which you can see patients really recover from cancer, people cure from cancer. It, it, it was the complexity and the ability to, to give people hope where there basically was none uh, to begin with. I think the most fascinating things is that I uh, trained when there were no tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there were no anti PE1s, there were no anti CLA4s, there was no CAR T. I was trained with only cytotoxic chemotherapy. But in my last years as a, as a resident, Sunidnep was discovered, PVAC, Imatinep were discovered, and you could see these remarkable responses in patients that were basically doomed. And of course, these drugs are all very toxic and being an internist, like treating kidney toxicity, skin toxicity, myelosuppression, nausea, all these different toxicities uh, were very challenging to manage. And I like the, the challenging part of internal medicine, solving the problems um, that the drugs cause, that the disease causes. And I think another thing that really drew me to oncology is the interaction with the patient. You know, you see patients from sometimes neoadjuvant or adjuvant treatments. You follow them up. Unfortunately, some of them relapse. You guide them through the process of metastatic disease into palliative care. You really connect with these people. It's it's a very long and often intense personal uh, journey uh, that you have with these patients. I think that even if you cannot cure a patient, providing comfort and preferably longevity to the patient, very, very rewarding in the ass. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, you're saying it, it, what you've seen over the last 10 years or so since you were um, a trainee, the, the, the improvements and the new, um, you know, the, the new opportunities for patients that have come on the market. Um, uh, like how, how, you know, where has that come from? Like, where's the, what was the tipping point in terms of what, what, you know, these new products that came? Well, I think there's, there's two aspects to that. I think one is improved diagnostics. Uh, we've seen that uh, from going from standard pathology, next generation sequencing and molecular pathology have taken a massive rise. We can sequence so quickly and so 
rigorously right now that um, it's very easy now to identify biomarkers in patients that will drive therapy and predict prognosis. In parallel, we've seen that with the discovery of all these new actionable mutations, we've seen the, the, the introduction of drugs that actually target these mutations, mm. providing massive benefit. For example, just it was a uniformly deadly disease if it came back mm -hmm. in the early 90s. Imagine that it is, it is like a miracle drug for these patients. A lot of them are cured by it. In those that do not cure from the disease, overall survival is going to be decades. So I think the combination of better diagnostics and more directed therapies is a major turning point that I've witnessed. And of course, the the, the, the biggest breakthrough is is the the absence of immunotherapy. When I started training melanoma patient in in my sort of fourth year residency, it was the carbazine, and then. There was nothing. And I remember putting my first patient on, on a epilimumab, lab, and it was actually a patient that did incredibly well. Uh, of course, epilimumab is a very toxic drug. It was this book that was dosed at a very high dose, much higher than we use today. There was a very significant toxicity, but there was also massive efficacy. And I know for a fact, I left that hospital two years after the, I treated that patient, but the patient's actually still alive. That was 2009. Please. Of course, after that one, we see the, the, the coming of, of anti-PD-1 drugs, the combination of anti-CTLA-4 with PD-1 inhibitors, the combination of TKI and, and immune therapy, and all the options that are currently being explored. And they provide so much benefit to our patient population. This is super exciting, super rewarding. But we've seen to have reached the plateau here at some point, you know, we see toxicity becoming an issue of going, of putting all these drugs together. Lanvatinib, pembrolizumab is fantastic efficacy wise in kidney cancer, but it's it has like eighty percent grade three, grade four toxicity, which is a lot. And you must take in consideration that grade three toxicity in itself doesn't say anything, because grade three fatigue means you're in bed all the time. And that's not so bad, but if you have like grade three afts or ulcers in your mouth and can't eat and lose weight, or have grade three, grade four diarrhea that severely impacts quality of life. So yes, you live very long with these drugs, good response rates, but if the, if the quality of life is severely affected, what's the, what's the balance for these patients? So I think we're learning and we're becoming more and more proficient in dealing with these toxicities and choosing the right combination for the right patients. Still, there's a long journey ahead. But I think like targeted agents, better sequencing, better imaging, better combinations, better understanding of mechanisms of resistance. These are like, in my career, the big turning points. Okay. Very good. And could you tell us uh, a bit about your involvement with ESMO and some of the projects that you've been working on with them? I've been involved in ESMO since 2012 when I was invited to join the Young Oncologist Committee, which mm -hmm. uh, was never on my radar. I just went to this Congress and there were people having a talk and I approached them and I got involved in discussions and all of a sudden I reached an invitation whether I would like to join them. And that was the best thing that happened to me throughout my entire career. You get introduced to all these super superstar oncologists uh, as a youngster. They are your mentors. I, I remember a few names specifically for Donato Ciardello, Christoph Sielinski, Rolf Stagel, Solange Painters, George Petrovudakis. These are all people that run the show uh, and rightfully so because they are experts in the field, but they are also great leaders and teachers. And they've taught me about research, about leadership, of how, how you give a preceptorship, how is that done? What is good research? How do you write a good research proposal? So in the YOC, the Young Oncologist Committee, I was uh, given the opportunity to build my own micro ESMO with our committee, a very young, a very enthusiastic group from all different countries. And that has grown ever since. But unfortunately, I turned 40, and at some point you're no longer that young anymore, so I was asked to leave. 
But I was offered the amazing opportunity to chair the practicing oncologist working group. And I think uh, this is a group that consists of people that are not in academia, that are like the soldiers that work in the low middle income countries in small and medium sized practices, sometimes being limited in resources, uh, imaging wise, surgery wise. And we tried to the best of our abilities to provide them with education, receptorships, tools on how to serve that part of the oncology community. And I've done that for several years. Um, truly amazing experience, fantastic group, got to learn a lot of uh, people that have become dear friends. But also that at some point comes to an end. So I stepped down as a chair after two mandates on December 31st of this year. And now I'm still involved in the publishing working group in which we are currently, uh, I'm one of the editors of a handbook on nutrition in cancer. I think it's very important because it's an overlooked topic, but we do great stuff. We do oncological emergencies with the iron books and the oncology. So basically there's whatever you want to do in oncology, whether it's just to watch other people, whether it's to be actively involved, work on guidelines, engage with the faculty, ESMO has something for everyone. And I think it's yes. an amazing experience to be part of that. Yeah. You you mentioned you're doing work in, yeah. Uh, you mentioned you're doing work in nutrition in oncology. Is that right? Uh, I'm the editor of the book. I'm not actually involved in research in that area. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's, it's just a book around nutrition and new it's about, uh, the mechanisms behind malnutrition and the mechanisms biochemically, what does low protein intake do? How does a catabolic state work? How do you get people back to anabolic? How to deal with issues like nausea, vomiting, radiation damages, anatomical disturbances due to surgery or radiation? What's the role of vitamins and supplements, alternative medicine? Uh, what's the role of enteral nutrition, parental nutrition? What are the complications of uh, feeding in the terminally ill patient when to start and when to stop feeding? She would uh, restrictions, fluid stimulation, complications of using fluids and IV uh, feeding. So I've been reading all these chapters since I'm one of the editors. Uh, and it taught me a lot. It was, it was very rewarding. I bet. Yeah, very interesting. So... Just to move on to the um, the health tech arena, and I, I'm very excited to ask you about this because uh, I know you do a lot of work in that space. Um, could you tell us about what you are most excited about in you know the field of health tech? I just think that we are on the verge of a true revolution in medicine. I am. Um, I think if you look at the pre-imaging era where the doctor had to do everything with his ears and his touch, like feeling lymph nodes and feeling masses and looking at his patient, listening with the stethoscope, being able to transition to imaging with an X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan. That was a massive breakthrough and provided a lot uh, of benefit to the patient and to the physician. But I think that the next breakthrough is is where we are right now with the advent of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning because the way we've progressed is by doing clinical trials. And clinical trials, if you're lucky, you have 2,000 very well categorized patients with very structured data. I believe you infer some very basic statistics. Overall survival, quality of life, very, very easy. But with the artificial intelligence, we're able to learn from a huge amount of very heterogeneous data, millions of slides, uh, millions of pathology readings, massive amounts of clinical data. And through machine learning models can do it so much better than us. If you look at ASCO GU, there was this, this presentation on, on, our, on our theta, the multimodal artificial intelligence uh, program. If you look at that, it, the promise that it has with using no resources other than computer power. It's able to outperform any clinical um, 
or imaging biomarker that we currently have simply by using a computer, analyzing a pathology slide, I think it's mind blowing. Another thing, if you see, of course, everybody's talking about ChatGPT. Uh, I think that this is another part of medicine that's going to completely change the way we feel and the way we think. We live as doctors in this, this ivory tower. We're the ones that examine you and we're the ones that give you the treatment. But we're humans. We're narrow minded, narrow sighted. We are trained in a specific way to look at problems in a specific way. If I look a ver at a very standard at prostate case, I come up with a treatment recommendation, but the chances are very high that if somebody from a different institute looks at the same patient, he comes up with a different treatment for exactly the same patient with exactly the same data. That makes no sense because there's only one solution for that problem. Then am I right? The other guy right? And I think artificial intelligence will greatly help us in, in building more robust medicine, tailor-made medicine. And stuff like ChatGPT hold great promise because the number of items that you can use it for are limitless. You can have a patient who is feeling sick reach out to a chatbot that is super well trained, for example, for prostate cancer and ask about her urgency, her hesitations, dysuria, rectal complaints, uh, sexual dysfunction. It's very easy to train the model if it only has to answer questions on a specific topic. Chat GPT, you can ask about law, medicine, health, history, economics, marital problems, uh, speeding tickets, it doesn't matter, it provides you with an answer. If you could train a model that focuses only on early prostate, advanced prostate, early kidney, they will do very well. Uh, the uses are basically endless. Mm. And this might be a little bit of a controversial question, but do you think that, that like the AI will replace cl clinicians or will it be like a support to clinicians? Mm. Well, um, I see it as a supportive tool. Yeah. I think there is no substitute for you and yet yeah, maybe a hundred years, I don't know, but I think uh, as a physician, we are very well trained at in interpreting body language patients, dealing with emotions of patients. Cancer is a very emotional disease. And uh, dealing with patients is one thing, but dealing with their relatives, um, dealing with their hopes and dreams and expectations of treatment, that's something I don't see a computer do very quickly. I know that a lot of patients go on WebMD or Google their symptoms, but at all times, they want my advice. Yes, I've been looking up this symptom, could it be this? And you can either confirm them, like could reassure them, but providing them with what that symptom means, how are you going to tackle that? Give some feedback on physiology of a symptom, what they can expect from a treatment, what we can do if it's not working, how have I think that we need that human touch. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, the world will be a very boring place. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and I was also wondering, you, you know, you mentioned that um, sometimes clinicians from can have two exact same patients and they'll come up with completely different treatment, uh, you know, treatment plans. I was wondering, um, is that what the role of guidelines is, like the ESMO, NCCN, and ASCO guidelines? Is it to kind of standardize these treatment decisions, or how does how that differ? I don't see I, the guidelines, in my opinion, are providing some guidance, as the word mm -hmm. implies, but nothing more than that. They mm -hmm. tell you about the evidence from clinical trials, they provide some guidance on the quality of that evidence, but I know that the guidelines are not always reflecting the best option for the patient. Often guidelines provide many options. For example, in, in disease X, in stage X, Y, or Z, these five are the treatment options. So they provide you with an option as which one's the best. So the guidelines are a tool 
to provide the structure in a very overproductive chaotic world. But I think that's as far as they go. Uh, oh, yeah. We need better. We need more than that. Absolutely. Yeah. If we if we're satisfied with the way things are now guideline wise, we set the bar way too low. Mm. We need to do better because the guidelines don't take into consideration individual characteristics. It's a guideline for a patient population, and there's no such thing as a patient population in your waiting room. There's a man, a woman, very specific ideas and very specific wishes on what he or she wants or does not want to treat. Do you see patients, your patients, um, you know, willing to adapt technology? Do you see them, you know, willing and able to, I know you mentioned WebMD, but, you know, if you suggested a piece of technology to them, do you think they would, they would use it? It depends. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, being a prostate and an oncologist, I see a lot of older males. And I see a lot of patients that are in their seventies, even eighties. And sometimes they are very reluctant. They find it difficult to even grasp the concept of the internet, of social media. Um, but I think we needed to gradually introduce it into medical uh, and, and medical practice. You know, we see uh, young people right now wearing the Apple Watch. It, it provides your saturation, your heartbeat. So they grow up with the availability of medical data as the wearable. Those that are 40, 50, 60 years old, they are more and more open to it and uh, mm. send out digital questionnaires. And of course, this is very simple. This is not very data medicine, but with, it, with the, uh, the arrival of COVID, we were forced to lock many hospitals. So we switched to getting the consultations, which is, of course, the first step. But we see a lot of people that are willing to step on a Zoom if necessary, make video consultations rather than coming to the clinic to discuss treatment options. I think having patients have consultations with AI chatbots and them to the physician, I think that's going to be difficult because there's all these GDPR issues, there's trust issues. And again, the personal aspect, I think, especially in the more uh, senior population is still very difficult. And yeah, definitely. We also have to take into consideration of cultural differences. Because I think uh, it's it's impossible to compare the evolution on this front from somebody like me up from Western Europe to somebody who grew up in and we evolved or, or South South America, where the yeah. uh, where the, the implementation adaptation of technology is a much slower pace than now here in Europe. Yeah, yeah. there's actually um, I've I've read some studies where you know they've like in in. A, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, they've skipped, you know, they've skipped the desktop internet generation and gone straight to smartphones. So there's some parts of the world that like are adapting faster than we are, um, you know, just because, because they got smartphones quicker and they never had a laptop. So, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of interesting in that regard. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, just in terms of the AI, I suppose talking about the AI, did you mention the AI as well? Do you think like the adoption of it, it's it, like in the past 10 to 15 years, I suppose adoption of medical technology has been quite slow. Um, do you think it'll be quite, do you think it'll be similar or because of the obvious benefits in, in pathology and jet G, GPT that can already be seen? Do you think it, it, it will be, the adoption might be a bit more fluid or a bit, a bit faster or? It depends. I hope so. I hope so because I see great benefits to it. Of course, uh, there's currently no legal framework, at least not in Belgium, on, on what can and cannot be done. Uh, well, yeah. What, what are its, its, its boundaries? What can it ask? What can't it ask? How do you store data? Who owns the data that is generated by me? I, uh, this is right now, these are all commercial uh, um, enterprises that build these technologies. Um, but I, I think if you look at chat GPT, that went like a snowball. I heard it mm. told it to 50 people. Those 50 people told it to 50 people. This is, is growing immensely. I know they're very rapid pace. 
And I think as soon as people become aware that meetings like USCO and ESMO and, and other meetings, 10 years ago, there were no sessions on AI or if there was, why well, it was a very poor quality and it was like a proof of principle or some high capacity generating uh, stuff right now, even at Oscar GU, it's, it's becoming main stage work. People see it's coming. And I think a lot of us know that it's, that we're not going to stop it. And I think it could be a very good thing. I think all it, the, the power that it has or could have is immense. We just need to figure out how to use it at its best and to facilitate uh, its implementation into daily practice and set the rules of the, uh, of the game. Because yes. that's, that's the, what I think is very challenging. At what point uh, do we consider it reliable? At what point do we say, yeah. no, what's reliable information from AI? And that? Yeah. I think that's, that's, uh, we, yeah, food for thought. Yeah. It's the supervision and the training. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the training is only going to be as good as the data you feed it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is that just a case of feeding it like the latest academic literature or, you know, kind of the best of the best publications? No, because literature holds basically no information. You know, if you have the average trial has 200 patients. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, somebody who's fairly adequate at statistics could do that uh, on a piece of paper. I think in order to really make it pharmacists, we, we need to start thinking about how we're going to collect data because you need high quality data, very structured data. There shouldn't be any errors. There should be redundancy in the data. I had, ideally, you would have these massive databases like SEER. But seriously, mm -hmm. only one of them should have some in Asia, in Russia, and in China, and Africa, and everybody. We should pull everything together. Then you get a good model. Yeah. Using five clinical trials, that's a meta analysis. That's not AI. Yeah. That's true. You need the, yeah, you need the, 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 the global database, as you mentioned. Um, and then that's the challenge of itself. You need to build a database from scratch. You need to say, okay, what are the elements that I need in my mail? I went ahead. This list is, uh, I don't know. I've been chatting a lot recently with, with somebody who was involved in Google AI. And he told me about the pitfalls and the difficulties in setting up such a database. That's not an Excel spreadsheet we're talking about. That's a mm. whole, whole different ball game. And the consistency and the quality of the data if, if you have all these data and you have like 30% missing, it is rubbish. And then after you made the model, you have to test it. You have to validate it. And that's, that's very challenging. But I think it's the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just moving on a bit away from technology, what do you see as the biggest challenges in the field of medical oncology at present? That's a very interesting question and a very difficult one. One I'm not really sure I have a quick answer to. I think our lack of understanding of the epigenome. Uh -huh. We know genomics, but we know that a lot of oncological phenomena, diseases, toxicity are not genome related, but epigenome related. What genes are turned off and turned on at what point and what regulates that and how will we influence that? I think that's going to be a hell of a job to finding that out. And I think that is super exciting. Also, the understanding. We've, we've seen the body as a group of organs that work together. But if we look now at the data that's being pulled and coming out of, of stuff like the gut microbiome and massive importance we have like a trillion, or I don't know the exact number of bacteria. That's that's a life within us that is super controlling the way we process sugars and proteins, and it, it regulates our immune response. I think this is something that we are just touching up upon, and I think those are very important. The role of nutrition, you know, 
That means the athletes diet all fat. Then we um, eat seven meals a day. You know, spread your meals, have some candy and some apples. Between. Now it's low carb, intermittent fasting. What's the role of the way we eat and when we eat? What's the role of nutrition there uh, in, in oncology? How does, how does our behavior, our lifestyle, our environment affect our body? We don't know. We've been treating cancer with atomic bronze for 50, 60 years. And we basically right now just started switching from atomic bombs to a sniper rifle, but it's still often hit or miss. And I think we could do much better, but uh, we just don't know that much yet. We think we do, but I think we need to be very humble. And we're always scratching the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good answer for um, something that you came up with off the top of your head. Very. Um, and it presents a lot more questions. <laughs> um, can you can you discuss any recent advances in cancer treatment that you find particularly exciting or promising in the last six to twelve months in treatment? Well, I, uh, I can only speak um, from some phase one trials that we are participating in another institute with, uh, in which we combine novel compounds that are in very very early stages of development that we combine with commercially available immunotherapeutics. And I've seen several patients with super advanced heart to treat diseases like sarcoma and that, or end of treatment metastatic kidney cell cancers that had all treatment options. And we give them these fancy new compounds that have no names and only numbers and that have induced durable responses that say, okay, this is exciting. And I think the combination of a new therapy with novel drugs that enhance efficacy of these drugs, limiting side effects of these drugs, bypassing resistance, um, I think that to me is like a true eye opener. A patient's that I would have thought, no way this is going to work. No way. And the patient had a new therapy that didn't respond for, for like three months. It was poorly tolerated. We reintroduced it with a different compound and it works like a charm. No side effects, tumors disappear. That is that is so rewarding to see that you actually see the advance of medicine helping your patients. That's that's a fantastic feeling. For any uh answer patients or caregivers listening to this, uh, do you have any advice on how they should approach their treatment? Depends on the patient and depends on the treatment. Um, I think being a patient, it's super informed, uh, super important to be very well informed. Don't be afraid of your doctor. Don't be afraid to put him on the spot. If he's not giving you a clear answer for your questions, get another doctor. Don't be afraid to hurt his feelings. Um, you know, I would not recommend people go on Google and look up everything you need, but like support groups, uh, trusted organizations, patient advocacies are often very great source of information. Uh, it's your life that's on the line. And if you, if you feel that you're not being treated the way you deserve to be treated, go somewhere else. Okay. Don't stick with the institute that's closest by or that has a great reputation. One size does not fit all. I know patients that were treated somewhere 60 miles away from my institute and they changed to my institution because it was a better fit. But the other way happens too. The patients stay. I've gone for a second opinion on, you know, the connection with the team there was just much better. I'm fine with that. You know, it's, it's their lives. Be very rigorous in the doctor and institute that you, that you choose. Is the doctor that is treating you, is he genuinely an expert? Because you only get one, John. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Michael. That was really, really interesting and uh, very helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Very nice. Thanks, boy. Cheers.